Hey guys, Spirit of the Law here. This video is about some features that were considered during the planning stages of Age of Empires 2 by the original developers, but were never implemented. That might be because of either time and budget constraints, or maybe they just didn't work out with the final direction the game went in. There are lots I could talk about, but I thought I'd boil it down to 8 of the coolest features that jumped out to me, in no particular order. The first scrap feature is actually a whole bunch of different ones, but I'm going to put them all together under the blanket category of special abilities. This included a variety of technologies you could research to unlock actions to give battles more strategic depth. An example is Shield Wall, which would have been an ability for swordsmen facing a missile attack head-on to raise their shields and gain an additional plus one pierce armor as long as they weren't moving. This reminds me a lot of the test doodle formation in the Total War series, and though I can't say it's ever a good tactic to have your unit stand still and take arrow fire, it would have at least been cool to see the accompanying animation and what use, if any, that players would have found for this. Another example is the Pikeman Lunge. The plan was for pikemen to be able to close the gap quickly against cavalry when they were within three tiles, increasing their movement rate at the last second. Likewise, pikemen were also meant to have a set against charge ability when standing still, letting them do triple the normal damage on their first attack against charging cavalry. Of course, this would only apply if the cavalry were attacking head on, so the direction pikemen were facing would have been a lot more important. Likewise, cavalry were meant to have a charge bonus of their own, where they inflict double damage if they charge from at least two tiles away. To prevent constant charging and repeating, this would have come with a cooldown period between uses, similar to monks after a successful conversion. All of these changes would have been pretty interesting to see, and could have made battles considerably more micro-intensive. The emphasis on formations and angles of attack again reminds me a lot of the Total War franchise, introducing a new level of strategic depth to large battles. It wasn't just land units getting extra abilities though, with naval units having a variety of ideas considered for them as well. The first was the ability to ram enemy ships, doing 50 damage to the target and 10 damage to the attacker. It's not entirely clear what would happen if two ships rammed into each other, as I imagine they frequently would. And it could be that it was dropped because it made every battle feel a bit too much like demo ships eliminating each other on impact, except without all the explosions, so basically way less cool. Another option for galley type ships would have been the technology Greek Fire. This would have been more as an anti-transport ship attack, damaging all of the units on board by 20 HP every 6 seconds. Alternately, you could cover a 2x2 patch of water tile with Greek Fire, which would burn for 30 seconds and damage anything that passed through it. It's easy to see how abilities that were intended for all galleys to be able to do were transformed into entirely different types of ships altogether, with the anti-transport ship aspect of Greek fire instead being reworked into the close-range fire galley, while the ramming ability was replaced by a ship that explodes. Yet another naval technology considered was grapple and board, which would allow one of your ships to immobilize a target while they continue to fire at each other. Depending on who won the fight, the trap ship would be either released or captured, similar to a conversion. An even more drastic game-changing feature than all of these special abilities was an entire class of civilization that never made it into the game, called Raider Civilizations. This included the Mongols, Celts, and Vikings. These civilizations were at one point meant to have a completely different playstyle than the more conventional ones. To train military units as a raider culture, you'd have to garrison a villager in your town center, which would be removed to create a military unit. Assuming they create villagers at the normal pace, that's a pretty brutal economic disadvantage, but raider cultures were given a few advantages to offset this. First of all, they don't have ages, which saves some resources and town center work time right away. They also have a few unique abilities. One, for example, is that their units would be immune from conversion, which it seems was meant to play a much bigger role in gameplay. Another was that they would be able to capture enemy villagers. Basically, the plan was for cavalry units to kidnap unprotected villagers instead of attacking them, and bring them back to your town center, where they would become your villagers. Again, much like a monk conversion. In that way, a unit that originally cost you one of your villagers to create could actually pay for itself back, possibly even several times over. I definitely see where they were trying to go with this mechanic and make civilizations that had completely different playstyles. It'd be interesting to know why this idea was ultimately scrapped, though I imagine there would have been a lot of issues balancing the civilization across so many different maps and settings. 
It's hard to see how they could be balanced for water maps when you'd have a hard time capturing units, or in deathmatch games where every military unit still requires you to make a villager first. You can actually try the kidnap mechanic with mods if you're curious to see how it works. A similar mechanic for Raider Civilizations was the concept of pillaging. Basically, you would target a building with that ability, and your unit would attack it, randomly dealing either half the normal damage to it, or successfully obtaining a few resources. These would be stolen directly from the defending player's stockpile, though you wouldn't actually get those resources until your pillaging unit successfully returned to your town center to drop them off. If the pillaging unit is intercepted and engages in a fight, or his HP reaches below 50%, he would drop whatever loot he's carrying, which could either be recollected by a different pillager, or gathered by a villager. I get the sense that raiding cultures were meant to do a lot of back and forth trips across the map, still retaining a bit of their resource gathering role as villagers. The third feature I want to look at is that buildings and walls were originally meant to block enemy missile attacks while still letting its own player and their allies fire through them. Basically, archers would no longer be useful offensive units, while defending archers would be overpowered and completely safe until the walls in front of them were destroyed. Likewise, repair villagers would be completely safe behind buildings, and turtling with archers would be a much better strategy overall. Personally, I'm glad this idea was left on the cutting room floor, as I just see it slowing down the game and creating an over-reliance on siege, while at the same time making crossbow raiding underpowered. The next feature is the idea of Gaia regeneration. This one could actually add a bit of realism while also helping in particularly long games. One of the occasionally frustrating aspects of Age of Empires 1 was that it was entirely possible to completely run out of resources without any way to get more. At least in Age of Empires 2, they added a new trade mechanic to address this problem, but it was also planned in early stages to have trees, animals, and fish regenerate around the map at a set rate up to a global maximum. For example, deer would not regenerate once all of them on the map were killed, but could repopulate as long as at least one was left. The exact implementation involved essentially binary fission, where a deer would magically become two. The supposed intention wasn't exactly to make animals an infinite supply of food, but simply because they thought having a few animals on the map made it look better. A somewhat related feature was that wolves, which weren't entirely killed, would also heal and become stronger the next time you face them. The idea was for them to also hunt around the map in packs, and to occasionally go into players' towns when they got hungry. A similar sort of mechanic that was never implemented was a new type of Gaia unit called an outlaw. They'd be like wolves in that they're randomly generated around the map and attack units that come near them, but with a specialization against trade cards. The plan was for them to search the map for potential trade routes, somehow, and then lie in wait. After a trade cart arrives, they'd fire arrows at it to make it stop, and then run off with the gold that it's carrying. The more successful they are along a certain route, the more they would favor going back to it. Between Outlaws and Wolves, it was certainly planned for the map to be a lot more hostile than what we ended up with in the final result. Considering the constant threat of attacks from Gaia, it's no surprise then that there was also a bit more diplomacy planned that never made it into the game. The next feature we'll look at was the implementation of temporary force treaties a player could initiate, which would make you allies for a short time period with another player if you were under a lot of pressure and needed a quick temporary alliance. Some civilizations were even planned to have bonuses relating to this. The Britons, for example, would have cheaper force treaties, whereas they would be more expensive for the Byzantines. Another somewhat related feature to this was the concept of fealty, the idea was that at any point, if you were being conquered by a player, you could declare fealty to them. If someone you were attacking decided to declare fealty to you, 50% of their resources would be sent to you automatically. In addition to that and a locked alliance, you would now gain cooperative control over their units and see all of their line of sight. On the other hand, the player swearing fealty to you doesn't get your line of sight or control any of your units. They simply become a client kingdom of yours, sharing your diplomatic status with every other player, while you hold the ability to override whatever they're doing if you don't like the look of it. At any point, you could also reject their fealty and go back to a neutral status with them. The only way they could be freed without you directly releasing them is if you're defeated. It's a cool idea in theory, though I could see a lot of 4 vs 4 matches online quickly turning into 5 vs 3 once a player starts to lose and they decide to switch to the winning team. 
Still, in a free-for-all, it would have been an interesting option to enable and would encourage players to expand and conquer rather than hide and stockpile resources. The last planned feature I want to mention is concerning relics. Ultimately, they decided to go with relics generating a steady supply of gold, but it may surprise you to learn the original plan was for them to give stat buffs. After picking one up, a monk would actually carry it into battle, where it would give all non-siege units within 7 tiles a 10% increase to their damage and a 10% debuff to the enemy's attack. Nearby friendly monks would also have a 20% conversion bonus, while your own units would be 20% more resistant to conversion. Killing the monk carrying the relic wouldn't even stop the bonus, as the relic remains yours and active as long as you were the last one to touch it. These bonuses could get even better though, as each relic would be specific to one of the game's civilizations when generated, excluding the raider cultures I mentioned earlier, who don't benefit from relics at all. If you happen to have a relic that was specific to your civilization, say you're the Franks and get hold of a Frank relic, those earlier bonuses are doubled, meaning your nearby units would do 20% more damage, while also taking 20% less. That's almost as large of a bonus as attacking from uphill, and of course would stack on top of any other hill and cliff bonuses. Alternately, they could still be used to generate 3 gold per second in a monastery. That's 6 times what they generate now. I'm not sure if having your own civilization's relic would also generate double the gold, but I imagine with a bit of playtesting they'd quickly find a relic generating 12 times what it currently does is a little OP. So those are 8 pretty major changes to mechanics that never made it into the game. Overall, I'm sure they made the right choice in not including a lot of these, but still it's pretty fun to try them out when people turn them into mods. Thanks for watching guys, and I'll see you next time.